everybody. Welcome in. Welcome in. It's very nice to see some bright and shining uh, usernames in the chat saying hello to all of us. Uh, I, I let Michael know and uh, and Robert know that we're uh, that you're all here today. If uh, you are also here in the chat uh, and you happen to know them or you're just happy to be in from whatever part of the world you happen to be in here, you know, make sure to let us know. You can type in the chat over on uh, if you're watching on YouTube. And um, I'm always happy to say hello. I'll be in the chat afterwards. Um, Welcome in to our Conversations with Authors series. Today we bring to you, as you might expect, Michael Goldberg, the author of Wicked Game, in conversation with Robert Duncan. Um, before we get to our authors properly, uh, please allow me to welcome you to uh, this event. Uh, if you've seen one of these before, well then welcome back, we're glad to see you uh, again. But if you are new here, then Book Passage is an independently run bookstore out of the San Francisco Bay Area, and we host and run book talks just like these quite often throughout the week. Um, as we are streaming on YouTube and will continue to do so in the future, please consider subscribing by clicking the subscribe button just below the video. It's completely free. It helps us out a ton. And as an added bonus, if you click the little bell right next to the subscribe button, you will be alerted every time that we go live with talks just like these. So you don't have to miss out on something you otherwise might have really enjoyed. If you would like to check out our upcoming events, you'd like the idea of an email newsletter, or more, most importantly today, if you'd like to buy our book today, um, please check us out at bookpassage.com and our speaker's book today, which again is Wicked Game, can be found in the very first link in the description just below the video that you are watching right now. Uh, finally, and this one's very important, if you have any questions for us tonight, please take the time to write them in the YouTube chat. It is your only way to get your questions to our speakers, so please don't miss your chance. Now allow me to introduce... First up, Michael Goldberg, uh, who is a journalist, a novelist, and a photographer. He has been interviewing and photogra photographing, <laughs> photographing musicians ever since he was 17. Uh, he was a senior writer at Rolling Stone magazine for a decade. His writing has also appeared in Esquire, New Musical Express, Cream, Downbeat, New York Rocker, Trouser Press, Musician, New West Vibe, New Times, and the San Francisco Chronicle, among many other publications. He has had three novels published, True Love Scars, the Flowers Lied, and uh, Untitled. <laughs> Author Simon Warner wrote, Michael Goldberg has his fingers on the pulse, his foot to the beat, his hip to the rhythm, and his ears peeled to the cadences of rock and roll's raucous jibber-jabber. Uh, in conversation tonight, we have uh, Robert Duncan, who is an American music critic, author, and entrepreneur. Duncan is married to the artist and photographer Ronnie Huffman. They have two children. Uh, Robert Duncan was managing editor uh, of Cream from 1975 until 1976, and a contributor to the magazine from 1974 to 1981. Duncan also writes poetry and novels. His poems have been published in uh, the Journal of Contemporary Dada Writing and Art. His first novel, Loudmouth, based in part on his experiences in music, was published on October 6th by Three Rooms Press. You can also definitely find that at bookpassage.com. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you uh, to our two speakers tonight. Let me hand over the show to you. Welcome. Great. Well, good evening. I want to thank Book Passage for arranging this event. And I want to thank all of you for being here this evening. And I want to thank Robert Duncan for agreeing to interview me. Um, you know, in addition to his years rock critic, you know, Robert is the author of Loudmouth. It's a rock and roll novel that is well worth your time. I spent the past three and a half years working on this book about Jimmy Wilsey. I interviewed over 60 friends, lovers, music business associates, and musicians who were close to Jimmy. Additionally, I drew on over four hours of interviews I did with them in 1987 and 1991, as well as three, a three-hour interview he did in mid-2018 that I was given access to. And I used over, I had over 10 hours of interviews I did with Chris Isaac from 1985 until 1995, as well as interviews with producer manager Eric Jacobson, co-manager Mark Plummer, and Chris Isaac's mother Dorothy. This book is a true labor of love. I began writing it because I wanted Jimmy to be remembered. He was an important musician. He should be in those top 100 guitar player lists. He was a lot more creative and a better player in the ways that count than a lot of people in those lists. As I worked on the book, it became a cautionary tale. And within Jimmy's story, I've told the story of the SF punk scene, of the Avengers, of Silvertone, 
Chris Isaac of the dark side of the music business and really the story of the dark side of rock and roll. Jimmy's story is a tragedy, but right now I'm gonna read some of the more upbeat sections of the book. When my son Joe was a teenager in the early 90s, Jimmy Wilsey gave him guitar lessons as a favor to me. This was when Wicked Game was a recent international hit. Each week, the two of us, Joe and I, would drive from our house in the Glen Park District of San Francisco, up and over the hill, down to the Victorian apartment on Oak Street, across from the Panhandle, where Jimmy lived in the Haight-Ashbury. We would sit with Jimmy, who often wore sweats and always a baseball cap, in the small dark room where his computer home studio was located. Cradling one of his Stratocaster guitars, for about an hour, Jimmy would patiently show my son how to play the killer riffs that drive the Rolling Stones the last time, and I can't get no satisfaction, or some other oldie Joe wanted to learn. There was no charge for these lessons. Jimmy was a busy man, a newly minted rock star, in fact. He had plenty of other things to do, but he and I had become friends, and that was the kind of thing Jimmy did for a friend. He was about 5'9 with brown hair when it wasn't dyed blonde, as it was in the late 70s when he was in the Avengers. Intense blue eyes and what Danny Furious of the Avengers called a smirk smile. He had compassion and charm. And when you were with Jimmy, at least back in the 70s, 80s, and start of the 90s, he made you feel like he was interested in you, cared about you. That made men want to hang with him and women want to sleep with him. Adorable. Adorably cute, sweet, and kind are words women I spoke to used to describe him. Quote, he just had that sex appeal that was real compelling, Lisa Bowman, one of his girlfriends in the late 70s, told me. He was the ultimate cool guy. I never heard him raise his voice. Even when he was excited, he would remain low-keyed. Touring Europe in 1987, wearing a long black leather jacket, Ray-Bans, and a black newsboy's cap, he was a rock star before he was a rock star. I had met Jimmy on the evening of February 6th, 1982 at Berkeley Square, a now defunct club located at 1333 University Avenue in Berkeley, California, where the second version of Silvertone, the version Jimmy formed with Chris Isaac, were playing. By then, Jimmy and Isaac had been working together for over a year. To see Silvertone live in the 80s was to experience rock and roll for the first time. The Beatles at the Cavern Club, 1961. That kind of excitement. The rhythm section was good that night, but Isaac and Jimmy had a spellbinding charisma. Together they were invincible. Isaac's moonlit voice brought to mind the great 50s rock and country singers. He could break your heart with a sad, spooky song like Blue Hotel, but there was an eerie existential quality to his singing too. Jimmy's guitar playing went beyond his retro influences. It was a rock and roll soundtrack for a 40s or 50s film noir, or one of Jean-Luc Godard's early 60s French New Wave films. By 1982, I'd seen a lot of bands, but none like Silvertone. They weren't intimidated by the great rock and roll groups that had come before them. When you heard Silvertone, particularly Isaac's voice and Jimmy's guitar, it was as if you were witnessing a great band the world had somehow missed that had slipped through the cracks a band that combined 50s rockabilly with 60s pop and 80s punk nihilism, Elvis fronting the Beatles, only with the anxiety of Joy Division. Two weeks after Jimmy's death, when Patti Smith, who most inspired him to become a professional musician, played the Fillmore Auditorium, guitarist Lenny Kay stood on the historic stage and paused between songs to honor his friend. Jimmy Wilsey was a great San Francisco musician, Kay said, before dedicating a cover of the Avengers, The American and Me to Jimmy, an Avenger singer-songwriter, Penelope Houston, a good guy and a great guitar player. Rock critic Joel Selvin had once celebrated, quote, the Wilsey sound, unquote, in a review of Isaac Silvertone published in the San Francisco Chronicle, noting that the vision may be Isaac's, the sound is Wilsey's. Wicked Game, the song featuring Jimmy's unforgettable guitar intro, the song that made Chris Isaac an international star is on albums and singles that have sold over 5 million copies in the US. 30 years after it became a hit and just 15 years after Spotify was founded, the song has been streamed 320 million times and another 50 million on YouTube. 
It was used in major 1990s sitcoms, including Beverly Hills 90210, Melrose Place, and Friends. In addition to David Lynch's Wild at Heart, the song was also used in a number of other films, including the 2000 hit The Family Man. Artists ranging from R.E.M. and the Red Hot Chili Peppers to Likey Lee, Pink, and Maroon 5 have covered Wicked Game in concert. Chris Isaac told me in December 1990, two weeks after Wicked Game reached number 10 in the British top 10, and before it became a hit in the US, that Jimmy was, quote, very responsible for that record being a hit. The, Wick the Willsey sound was more than the Wicked Game intro, and it wasn't that song's popularity that made Jimmy important. It wasn't his technical skills on the guitar, though he was a skilled, practiced player. Eric Jacobson, who produced the four Chris Isaac albums Jimmy played on and are made friends with the guitarist via phone and the internet until his last years, got close when he spoke about his, quote, magical touch and used the word atmospheric to describe what Jimmy brought to a song. But there was more to it. By the 1980s, it could seem difficult, perhaps impossible, to be an original. By then, it seemed that previous guitarists had done everything one could do on the guitar. Jimmy proved otherwise. His originality certainly had to do with what he played, but more than that, he was a kind of, it was a kind of essence rare. His distinctive touch enveloped the songs in sadness. It was as if his riffs had Willsey imprints, the musical equivalent of fingerprints. No one sounded like Jimmy. There is footage from the beginning of Chris Isaac and Silvertone's 1989 European tour, which can be seen on Eric Jacobson's All About Eric website at the Marquee Club that perfectly demonstrates what Wilsey could add to a song. As Isaac sings the words to Danson and plays the hypnotic rhythm guitar that runs through the entire song, Jimmy adds eerie lead guitar segments, building and building tension until his guitar and the desperation in Isaac's voice merge reaching a denouement of despair. As New Yorker music critic Amanda Petrusich writes in her 2014 book, Do Not Sell at Any Price, the wild obsessive hunt for the world's rarest 78 RPM records, quote, the most important component of any country blues song is still the performer's articulation of blues feeling, that amorphous, intangible, gut-born thing that animates all music and gives it life. What Jimmy brought to the songs he played on was a version of blues feeling. There's another name for that, soul. Quote, he was very much the stylist, one time Silvertone bassist Jamie Ares, who played with the guitarist for nearly three years in the early 80s, told me. He, quote, he had his own style. It was very distinctive, a particular sound. I felt like his forte was doing the spooky sound. Spooky, love loss. He wasn't one of those players who would play a million notes in a second. He was looking for the value of each individual note, which I really appreciate. He was kind of like a sculptor. He was looking for negative space, the places where nothing was happening, yet that's where it all was happening. That sound that he worked on, that he developed, that was the signature, signature of the whole band, American Music Club leader Mark Eitzel told me. Of course, Chris Isaac's singing is amazing, but the David Lynchian guitar thing that he had going was so defining for Chris's band. The Jefferson Airplane's extraordinary guitarist, Yorma Kakawin, who, who was in Hot Tuna with bassist Jack Cassidy, wrote in his book, Been So Long, My Life in Music, quote, in my opinion, Jimmy was the architect of Chris's sound. Jimmy dug the Avengers the first time he saw them. Quote, I really like this one band called the Avengers, he said during our May 1991 guitar player interview. I liked what they were doing. I'd met a couple of them, and I thought they were pretty neat. The, the Avengers were a punk rock band, a San Francisco punk band that um, formed and start, began playing the Mabue Gardens in San Francisco in 1977. Quote, I remember when Jim saw the Avengers play for the first time. His girlfriend, Claudia Summers, said, quote, Jonathan Postal was with them on bass. I remember Jim saying, quote, I could play bass better than he does. And at that time, Jim had never played bass. I looked at him and said, have you ever played bass before? And he said, it would be easy. Jimmy had gotten to know Penelope Houston before he knew she was in the Avengers. He saw her, quote, around town a lot 
but didn't know who she was. She'd seen him busking on Polk Street, and he would run into her at parties. To Jimmy, she was the girl with the blue hair. One evening in July 1977, Jimmy came across Houston at City Lights Books and asked if she needed a guitar player for the Avengers. She didn't, but did he play bass? Quote, I lied and said I can play bass, he said. I sold my guitar and bought a Hagstrom bass and an amp the next day, and I was in the band. Danny Furious, the Avengers drummer, quote, Penelope said he wants to be our new bass player. And I said, yeah, sure, why not? Sight unseen or unheard, he was in. God, I love that guy. Avengers guitarist Greg Ingraham, quote, so he came up to me at some random point at the Mabue one night, and I said, I hear you're looking for a, and, I, and said, I hear you're looking for a bass player, and I want to play in your band. He said he was Jimmy Wilsey. I said, do you play bass? And he goes, no. I thought that was kind of cool. And I said, well, do you have a bass guitar? He says, no. Just the way he said it, no, I don't, but I'm going to play bass in your band. It was so typical, Jimmy. I said, well, OK, just show up at rehearsal on such and such date. He was quite a character. He had this suave coolness about him. There was nothing arrogant or pushy about him. He was just super nice, super cool guy. You kind of got the feeling, I don't care how good you are. I want you in the band. So he shows up, and he has with him a Hagstrom bass. Because he told me the night before, I'll have a bass. I'll bring something. I said, OK, sure, however you're going to do it. So he shows up with this Hagstrom bass, and he was laughing. And he says, you're not going to believe this. I didn't have a bass on my way to the rehearsal. So I stopped off at this pawn shop at 6th and Mission Streets. I found this bass for $75. I thought, oh, this will be perfect. A friend of ours loaned him an amp. So Jimmy just nailed it. He nailed the rehearsal. What do you mean you've never played bass before? He was perfect. So of course, he got the gig. Wow. You ready to talk, Michael? I'm ready. That, yeah, that's that's a sure. great story, and it reminds me. And I, I should I should ask you this a little later. The it's such a great history of uh, the music scene in in San Francisco. This book, um, but you know, let's just start from the top. Most people have never heard of Jimmy Wilsey, but they have heard "Wicked Game," the Chris Isaac mega hit, and uh, so. Tell, give some detail on how Willsby was involved in the uh, in the making of Wicked Game, giant well, worldwide hit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, well, Chris Isaac, um, according to Jimmy, Chris Isaac had a verse and a chorus, and um, he played that for for Jimmy, and Jimmy started messing around which is what you know i mean I, I think he probably got a got a tape with you know from chris or something until you know just a funky demo tape mm -hmm. and and he just came up with it i mean he came up with you know it's when you hear that the beginning of that song what you hear essentially are two notes that jimmy is uh doing his his magic with and the way he plays those two notes I mean, you've just never heard anything like that before. And now, today, when you hear it, I mean, this, you instantly know the song because it's so, they're so memorable. Um, and so, yeah, he said this was one of the songs where he just came up with it like right away. Um, and that was not always the case. Some of his guitar parts, he said he worked on, you know, for months. But this one, and he said with this one, he said the first time he played it for Chris Isaac, Chris Isaac didn't like it. He thought it sounded out of tune and he just, you know, so Jimmy just kind of let some time go by. And then at another point in time when they were, they were ready for guitar parts again, him and both Chris Isaac and the producer, Eric Jacobson, Jimmy played the same thing again, this time, they thought it just sounded great. And, uh, and then, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy worked on it to get it just right for, um, you know, in the studio. 
Yeah, it, it's when you were talking about it, I'm thinking it's impossible to imagine that song without that riff or certainly with that with it meaning as much as it came to mean. Um, but what made it what made it have such an impact? Well, the thing was, um, nobody thought that song Wicked Game was a single or a hit. That was just one of the songs that was just going to be on the album to, you know, fill out the album, Heart Shaped World. And um, what happened was David Lynch K showed up and wanted some music to include, put into his film, Wild at Heart. And so they gave him tapes and he listened to stuff. And, and then um, he decided that he wanted to use Wicked Game, but just the instrumental, ver uh, instrumental version of it. No, no Chris Isaac vocal. So, and the instrumental version is basically Jimmy's guitar and, you know, some, some a rhythm track that they've sampled. And so it, you know, it's really Jimmy. So that showed up in Wild at Heart. So this um, music director or program director at a radio station in Atlanta goes to see Wild at Heart. And he flips, absolutely flips when he hears that, the Wicked Game music, Jimmy's guitar part. And he says, he, he told me he went back two more times to see the movie just so he could hear it. And then um, he eventually got the soundtrack when it came out. And the version on the soundtrack had Chris Isaac's vocal on it. He started playing that on his radio station. And so that, because it was getting a lot of airplay on this one station, Warner Brothers decided, well, we'll release this as a single. So they release it as a single and their promotion people start trying to get it played on other stations, but no one else will play it. So um, Eric Jacobson, who had produced the song, but who was also Chris Isaac's manager at that, well, at that time, he goes to the president of Warner Brothers Records and says, well, can you use some payola? Can you get this thing on the radio? And the president of Warner Brothers Records said, no, I, I'm not going to do that. But he says, but I'm going to give you $100,000, and you can use that to promote the record. And so Eric Jacobson told me that he started paying off um, program directors and music directors. At st he started working stations sort of around, you know, in the vicinity of, of that Atlanta station and kind of spread out from there. And, and that was how he got the record that started with radio. Now, I just so listeners understand, people who are here understand, that was actually very common at that point in time. And many, many records by superstars of the day, as well as unknown artists like Chris Isaac, that's how they were able to get the songs played on the radio. Now, once a song gets played on the radio, doesn't mean it's going to become a hit. Some songs are what they call radio hits. They're played on the radio, but um, no one goes and buys it. Wicked Game was a song. Once people heard it, they started buying it right, right away. And um, so, so really, though, you know, it all started with that instrumental in Jimmy's guitar and Wild at Heart. I mean, that's how, that's how the song had a chance. And then, of course... Herb Ritz um, made the video that everyone saw on on uh, you know MTV, uh, and that sort of helped take it to a, to another level. Yeah, um, you know the 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 first thing I thought when I when I uh, when you told me about the project and I read the book and enjoyed the book, but it was I thought you know why did you write a book about Jimmy Wilsey? And you know I thought can this guy can this this talent carry a, a 300, 300 and something page book, you know, is this, is this guy important enough to do this? Now you make a, a strong argument in the book, but, but make your case. Um, well, I mean, you know, the, the, so, the song to this day, it's being streamed millions and millions of times every month. So, um, I mean, 
for for that alone, I mean, he's a guy that should be remembered. But more than that, I mean, the Avengers, the band that he was basically, it was Jimmy and Penelope Houston were the were the sex symbols of the Avengers. They were the people, the the two people at the front of the stage, and uh, you know, people just loved them. I mean. They were, I mean, the punk scene in San Francisco in 1977 was really small. I mean, it was like, you know, initially it was like, you know, a few hundred people. And it slowly grew to, you know, maybe a thousand people or so. But um, pretty quick, the Avengers could pack the Mabue Gardens, 400 people packing a club. And Jimmy was within the small of punk scene of San Francisco, Jimmy was a star. I mean, he he was one of the guys. Um, he also um, co-wrote the Avengers' most popular song, We Are the One. So, and the Avengers are an important punk band. I mean, Greel Marcus and Lenny Kay both think they are one of the important punk bands, I mean, period. Um, they didn't get the notoriety that, say, the Sex Pistols did, or, or the, Ram the you know the Ramones did, but, but they're they're an important band. So he was in that band. Then, you know, he he was in and played on the first, uh, basically the first four Chris Isaacs records, and those records, I think, particularly the first two, are just classic albums. I mean, the first album is incredible from start to finish. I mean, it's just an amazing record. It was not initially very popular. And it, it, and even to this day, um, you know, it, it hasn't sold a lot of copies, but, you know, it should have. I mean, it's just an amazing, really you know, great record. And so, you know, I think Jimmy deserves, I mean, I just think Jimmy is one of these guitar players who really is one of the one of the great guitar players. He's underrated, but I think his playing was, you know, was very unique and that he, uh, and so, yeah, I think his story, you know, based on that alone. I also think the story of, you know, as I, I think I, had, I mentioned earlier, I mean, his story is the story, in a way, is the story of a lot of side guys. And, you know, um, they deserve to have their story told. And so in a sense, even though Jimmy's story is unique to Jimmy, it's also in a way giving a little nod to all of the, all of the Jimmys, the, the, the important musicians in bands who don't happen to be the front, the front man or front woman. Um, so, you know, so there's that. And, uh, and the way I did this book, um, you know, there's a lot, I mean, there's the story of Chris Isaac is in this book, you know, as you mentioned, the, the story of San Francisco punk is in this book. The story of the Avengers is in this book. Um, so, you know, the, there's also a theme because Jimmy became a heroin addict, um, you know, her, you know, drug addiction. And, and what kind of factors lead to drug addiction? Why does someone become addicted to drugs? That's, that runs through the entire book. And I think I, in my research, I found out some things that a lot of people might not be aware of. Um, and so as a cautionary tale, I thought, I thought it was pretty important. Yeah. Um, you and Jimmy uh, became friends. Uh, how did you get to know him? And you know, what was he like? In person, well, you know, like I said, I I met him initially in 1982 when I went I went and saw Silvertone. I was I was looking for bands for a piece for the San Francisco Examiner, like you know, new rising bands. I wanted four bands, and a lot of people were telling me about this band Silvertone, and so I went and saw them at the Berkeley Square, and I met Eric Jacobson, and I I had been a fan of Eric Jacobson, the producer, since I was a teenager. And I heard these records by the Love and Spoonful. And I, you know, he, he uh, produced seven top 10 hits for the Love and Spoonful. Yeah. And, and I, um, I looked on the back of the records and I saw produced by Eric Jacobson. And so 
then I started looking at the back of records, you know, and trying to find records produced by Eric Jacobson, and and there were others. Um, so it was a big deal to meet Eric Jacobson, and the fact that Eric Jacobson was was producing um, and co-managing Silvertone made me, you know, want to know about Silvertone. But anyway, he took me backstage, and that's when I met I met the four guys who were in Silvertone at that point. Um, then some years went by, and then the first um, the first album came out, and they stopped calling themselves Silvertone, and it switched to to, well, to Chris Isaac in Silvertone, but on the records it just said Chris Isaac, and that was because there was partially because there was a concern on Warner Brothers' part that Sears, that owned the uh, copyright on the name Silvertone because they had had, you know, Silvertone guitars, Silvertone uh, record label, and some other Silvertone products. This is, you know, concerned that they might try to sue. Yeah. So, um, so at that point, that Chris Isaac used that sort of as an excuse to start having the group, you know, go by his name. And um, so once that, when that record came out, um, I wrote about them for or Isaac for Rolling Stone. I went as I started going to a bunch of shows. You know, I would see, you know, see Jimmy at the shows and didn't really get to know him, but I, I just became somebody that was uh, occasionally around. Uh, but we became friends in um, basically in 1991 when um, I was doing a story on digital recording. And Jimmy was one of the first people who was using his, um, a computer, an Apple computer, to do multi-track recording with a brand new program that had been, been written by some guys in, in San Francisco. And so, so I ended up, you know, interviewing Jimmy for that story and, um, you know, spending some time over at his place. And then I... Um, I started an independent record label and I thought Jimmy should do an instrumental album because he would, he would play, you know, some kind of classic instrumental stuff by Link Ray and others often at the end of uh, the Chris Isaac, you know, Silvertone live sets. And I just could imagine a great instrumental solo album done by him. So I was trying to get him to go for that. I could get him to go for that, but in the course of me going over to his place and us having conversations, we just became friends. I mean, we were both, we bonded over being big fans of the Rolling Stones and Jimmy had all these Rolling Stones videos. And so we'd watch Rolling Stones videos. And, you know, I was really interested in the whole digital recording thing. So I'd come over there and watch, you know, how he worked on that. And, um, you know, so that was, that was basically how, you know, how we became friends and started hanging out for a bit. I mean, why did he not want to do a solo album? Um, well, he, he, he might have wanted to do a solo album. He probably wanted to do it, if he was going to do a solo album, do it for, for a big label, you know. And I was just starting this, this national records label, um, which I, you know, I put a Flame and Groovies out, album out on it. Right. But, um, yeah, he, I mean, he never, he never said... He also may not have had the material. You know, it actually took him until 2008 to have to pull together enough material to do a, a solo album. He did one solo album. That's right. Um, can you talk about talk more about your career as a rock journalist? Um, you, know, you were as you were at Rolling Stone for a, for a decade. Um, you said you have said you started writing music and uh, writing about music in high school in the 60s and uh, talk about your own your own career as a rock journalist and you know where rock journalism is at this moment and where sure. it was back then well i mean you know like i mean i mentioned earlier you know i i read cream magazine I read Rolling Stone. I mean, I, I read the first issue of Rolling Stone standing in the Tides bookstore in Sausalito, you know, just pretty much read it cover to cover. Um, and then I started buying it after that. And I, I was a, a good writer in school. I was always a good writer. And so in, you know, elementary school. And so I kind of got, you know, 
I just got the idea, you know, this would be so great to, to write about, you know, music and musicians. And it seemed like it could be, it was like an entree into that world that you could actually, you know, I mean, I was reading these stories by journalists and they're like in the studio when the Rolling Stones are working on something or when the Beatles are, are, are working yeah. on something, you know, and yeah. I'm just thinking, wow, I mean, that would be so great to be able yeah. to have, have that entree in. And I also, at the same time, I mean, as a incredible reader, you know, I mean, I was reading from a really young age and I, you know, was reading that by that point I was reading the New Yorker and, and, you know, and, and I just thought it would be so great to do, you know, like New Yorkers kind of profiles of musicians where you really could, could get in there and, and, you know, essentially show people their world. So anyway, um, you know, in high school, I started writing uh, rock criticism uh, for the, for the high school paper. And then um, a good friend of mine and I, we're, we were we were doing all kinds of stuff with music. We were putting on uh, dances at the auditorium. We got Michael Bloomfield to play one, um, who was a big star at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we decided we were going to start a, lo a Bay Area rock magazine. And so we did one issue. And so we were in the course of just getting started working on an issue. And we were friends with the son of Tom Donahue, who was the, the man who started underground rock radio. He started, uh, he got a station in San Francisco called KMPX and started, they started programming all this like, you know, kind of underground, um, you know, rock music, all this stuff, a lot of things that hadn't even been released yet. And I mean, it was really an amazing radio station. Well, his son was in high school. He, you know, we, we, me and my friend, we were Frank became friends with his son. So one day we park our car up on Mount Tam and we're walking up the road to where Tom Donahue's house is and standing at the top of his driveway is Jerry Garcia. And I go up to Jerry Garcia and I say, I say, um, excuse me, but, um, me and my friend are starting this rock magazine and we'd really like to interview you for it. And he says, sure. <laughs> I mean, it was just amazing. <laughs> I mean, I was 17 and, yeah. and he says, and I say, okay, well, you know, when can we do it? And he, and he says, well, you come to my place, you know, next Tuesday. And he gave me the address of his place in Larkspur. And so you know, that was like my first experience <laughs> of interviewing, I mean, a real rock star, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and, uh, you know, so that's how things got started. Well, what, um, uh, I, I got to ask you, what was the name of the magazine? And yeah, it, is there an issue out there that collectors could pick up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the magazine was called Hard Road, and it was called Hard Road after um, – John Mayo on the Blues Breakers had an album called The Hard Road. Oh, I remember, yeah. Okay. Well, our idea was, you know, the musician's life, it's a hard road for most yeah. musicians to get, even for musicians who become, you know, it's like the Beatles playing, you know, in Germany for Hamburg or whatever for months, you know. Right. I mean, it's like it usually doesn't just happen overnight. And right. uh, so so anyway, that's why we called it called it Hard Road. Yeah. Yeah. And if, so I, we can find a copy on uh, on eBay or something. I don't know where you can find it. I ha I have you know about a dozen of them in my house. Right, well. <laughs> They're not on eBay. <laughs> and so you were never a musician. You did you didn't come at it from you were playing music and decided you would write. No, I about was it. doing that too. I was doing everything. I mean, yeah. we were we were putting on the dance concerts. I put together a light show group. And so oh, we yeah. did the light show for the for the <laughs> dance concerts that we did. Um, I, you know, played electric guitar a little bit and wrote songs. And you know, you oh, know, okay. we we had a band for a little a little while. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I I did did all, all that stuff. But writing and photography were really the two things that um, I was really good at. And yeah. and early on, I was really good at both of those things. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, let me take you back to uh, Jimmy. 
Um, Jimmy became, as you, you uh, mentioned, he became addicted to heroin. And uh, well, you didn't mention that uh, he died homeless. It's it's a it's a really um, tragic, tragic, it's just tragic. What happened? A, a sad, sad story. But explain how that happened. How you go from being, you know, the sex symbol of the Avengers to the the heart and soul of uh, Chris Isaac's band to being to being really badly homeless and badly addicted. And well. Um... When Jimmy was a kid, his family moved around a lot. Um, you know, by the time he was um, was ten, they had probably moved something like five times, may maybe maybe more. And um, and as it turns out, that is one of the factors that can lead to addiction. Um, and you know, probably part of it is that you know you make a friend with, and then you're not, suddenly you're not there. I mean, you can't count on, on anything. So there was that. And then there was also, um, you know, his father was in the air force and it was very stern situation. And, um, and Jimmy felt like he did not get support from his parents for his creative endeavors. Um, uh, when he was, uh, when he was in high school and, you know, going off, going off to college. Um, and so I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, Jimmy kind of had a hole, you know, inside him and a pain inside him. And, um, you know, you learn, you can, as a, as a person with some of some, oh, he was also clinically, he was clinically depressed as a child, he, he only found that out much later. Um, but, but that was something that he, that his whole life, he was, he was, you know, clinically depressed. And that's another factor, um, in, in addiction. And, um, he's, he, you know, you, you learn with addiction. One of the things I learned is people learn to use drugs and alcohol to escape from that pain that they feel. And Jimmy started doing that in high school. I mean, first he was smoking marijuana. He was, they were, you know, drinking hard liquor. You know, his friend would come over. They'd have some gin fizzes before they'd go to high school. Um, later in high school, he was, he was taking other various other drugs, including speed. Um, so it started pretty early. And um, when he, moved to San Francisco, I mean, there was a lot of drugs happening around the punk scene, including heroin, but Jimmy didn't start using heroin as far as I can ascertain when he was in the Avengers. He was using speed. He was, um, you know, dropping acid sometime. I mean, you know, he was, you know, cocaine, but um, it was after he was in uh, Silvertone that um, he started smoking Persian brown heroin. Which is an that's sort of an easy way to um, to get addicted because you don't start out using needles. That comes later once you're addicted. And then in terms of in terms of Jimmy being homeless, um, he at the end of his life. I mean, well, when he was in 2014, he had to have get a new liver uh, because mm -hmm. you know the, all that all the drugs and alcohol had had fucked him up messed him up <laughs> and um so he had to get a new liver he he never really recovered i mean he did you know he didn't want to take the drugs that you have to take he also pretty quickly was using hard drugs again um and the, you know he he went into rehab but he as soon as he came out and then he's using again and um by 2018 he was living in a house that his wife, his ex-wife was renting in Eagle Rock, California. Jimmy was in that house, but he was really seriously messed up with drugs. And, and then they all got evicted because that house was a, I mean, there was someone else there who was dealing drugs and drugs. And um, it was, it was a very bad scene. And so, um, so they all got evicted and Jimmy started living in his car for a while. And 
I mean, he called people up and asked if he could come crash at their at their you know place, a bunch of people, but no one wanted to, wanted him to do that because by that time, you know, everybody knew that he was you know addicted to drugs, and nobody nobody wants somebody who's addicted to heroin living at their house. I mean, because you can't trust a person who's addicted to heroin. I mean, they'll do anything. Um, so anyway, he's living in his car. And then before too long, he was um, sleeping on a piece of cardboard on um, basically a, along the side of, of this building that um, this woman owned who discovered him out there and uh, was ultimately was the one who called the ambulance to bring him to the hospital. Um, and he, he died um, on Christmas Eve day, December 24th, 2018. He was only 61 years old, which it's, you know, yeah, it's re re really very tragic ending yeah. to his life. Um, yeah. You know, um, you, uh, you have a, an amazing uh, breadth of interviews in the book and, and, and really great, great interviews, including you managed to, get an interview with his first girlfriend and his a uh, one of his more i don't know if it was his last girlfriend but one of his yeah. one of his last girlfriends uh, who was a who was a movie star and um was that you know i i was surprised at the candor uh which with which they spoke about him but i i how tough was it to get them to talk um and share those secrets well you know, I um, the first the first person I talked to was Claudia Summers, who was Jimmy's first girlfriend. They they um, you know it was it was practically the last week of of high school for Jimmy when he got up enough nerve to go um, you know start talking to her. And according to her, I mean, they basically fell in love like instantly, and um, and you know. Um, the first time I talked to her, she was just fairly candid about things. I mean, um, and, but then as time went on, because I, I, we exchanged a lot of emails where I would send her questions. I mean, first we talked, I mean, we talked a lot on the phone as well, but then I would send her a question and she'd send me back, you know, a couple of graphs worth of, of an answer to, to that, to that particular question. And at a certain point, she um, she asked me if I'd like to see the letters that Jimmy had written her um, when they were separated right. um, in the summer of um, of seventy six before he came out to San Francisco, um, and so she shared you know all these all these letters and Jimmy was very um, you know I mean I mean he had a really close relationship with her. She was someone he, he really shared his innermost, you know, feelings. And, um, and so that was, you know, I don't know why I never asked her why she chose to do that. I think she, I think she did it because she wanted this book to be, um, to really get at who, you know, who Jimmy was and, uh, and what he was like. And, uh, she felt like some of the things in those letters would, um, you know, would help help do that, and that was definitely the case. And I really yeah. appreciated um, all of her help. Um, Jennifer Rubin, who was in, um, she had a brief. She played Edie Sed Sedgwick in uh, right. the Oliver Stone movie The Doors, a very brief part in that. She was also um, in uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Three. Um, she had a, a, a significant role in that, and then she was in a lot of other things. Um, you know, the hard part was finding out her name. I mean, the first time I, when I, you know, back in 2000, early 2019, um, when I, people started telling me that Jimmy had had this um, actress girlfriend and they couldn't remember her name. And for the next two years, every time I'd interview somebody, I'd say, well, do you know about the fact that Jimmy had this actress girlfriend around 1990 and, and, and they, you know, no one knew her name. And then, you know, two years into it, someone knew her name. And uh, 
actually, it might have been that I was searching for photos of Jimmy and one popped up with her in it. Ah. That might have been, I mean, it's hard for me to remember at this point because so many, because, but I mean, that did happen. Yeah, and, and you so, could do a search for the, the image. And so anyway, um, once I knew her name, then it actually wasn't too hard for me to, um, I was able to get um, an email address. And, and so I emailed her and she responded. She wanted a, but here's the, here's the crazy thing. And I didn't know this when I started interviewing her. And, and we had talked for maybe an hour. And then I said to her, well, when did you first find out that, that Jimmy was using heroin? And she was like, she acted like she was flabbergasted, that she didn't, she didn't know that he had used heroin. Um, and then I said, at some point, I said something about, you know, well, when Jimmy died and she screamed, she literally screamed because she did not know that oh, Jimmy geez. was dead. She thought I was doing a book on Jimmy and he was, he was alive. Oh, and um, yeah, it was, it was really very heavy. I mean, I, you know, oh. I mean, I, I did, I didn't feel real good about, you know, being the one to, to let her know that, that, that he died. But um but yeah, she was, um, again, she was just really open. Um, and maybe it's because she'd never had an opportunity to talk about Jimmy and about their relationship and, um, and, and that kind of thing. And so, but, uh, and, you know, and maybe it's just, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, but, but that was, you know, that was actually, you know, not, that wasn't late, late in his life. That, that was just late in his sort of time with Chris Isaac. Um, you know, he, you know, he ended up after that, um, you know, he was, he was married for a bunch of years. Um, but then the dr drugs ended that relation, that, you know, his marriage. And, uh, and then he had, had other girlfriends, um, you know, pretty much pretty close to the end of his life. Um, I, I, I want to be mindful of our time, but yeah. I want, let me ask you, you, what was the, what was the hardest thing about writing the book? You talked about talking to Jennifer Rubin. That's. Yeah. Well, I mean, locating her was the hardest thing. And I felt like I felt it was important to locate her because one of, one of the co-managers of Silk for a while, Eric Jacobson and, and Mark Plummer co-managed Silvertone and then co-managed Chris Isaac. And um, so Mark Plummer had said that when this was really at the, I mean, this was like, you know, in, in you know, January of 2019, right? You know, uh, I was working on a story about Jimmy's um, death for Rolling Stone at that point. And Mark Plummer told me that, um, there was this actress, and when she broke up with Jimmy, it was just devastating to him. And and as Plummer told it, you know, that sent him deep into the drugs. But, you know, that's – people who are addicted to hard drugs are just looking for excuses to, yeah. to, to you know, to be using the hard drugs. And so, you know, they can always find one. That happened to be the excuse of the moment. Um, yeah. You know, but um, but because of that, I thought, well, I have to find, you know, this woman because it seems it seems anyway from what Mark Plummer says that, you know, this was critical this relationship, and so um, and it turned out I remembered when he told me that that I had actually met her um, in uh, 1991 when I went down to L.A. with um, with Chris Isaac and and the band. And um, for a Rolling Stone story. And um, so, so, you know, that next two years of, of trying to find, that was the hardest thing about, yeah. it. you know, the other thing that was hard was just um, writing about this, you know, the, you know, 
the drug stuff and the homeless stuff and the, you know, the, you know, the, the time, the times when, you know, he was, you know, going through withdrawal and, and, um, you know, and his friend, you know, trying to, to help him and get him somewhere where he could, you know, deal with that. And, you know, those things, um, the first time you, you know, someone is telling you about a situation like that, it's, I mean, it's really, really difficult to yeah. listen to it. And, and it's really difficult to write about it uh, because it, it puts you right there. And if you were right there, you know, how would you feel? You know, well, you would feel horrible and, and you'd feel a little hopeless and, and helpless about what can I do? How can, what can I do for this person? And, you know, so, and you feel kind of like that as you're like writing, writing this stuff that, that has happened. So those, those things were, um, were really difficult at first. I mean, as time goes by, I mean, it's, it's a weird experience, but you do get, um, you know, it becomes something that you, it's, it's becomes less hard yeah. just yeah. because you've dealt with it. But yeah. One last thing before we get the hook, I, I just wanted to, you, you're give, uh, Jimmy had a son, has a son uh, named Waylon and talk about what you're doing for Waylon. Yeah. Well, I decided early on that I was going to donate 25% of my royalties to Jimmy's son, Waylon, who is now 18 years old, um, going to start college soon. And I just felt like if I was going to write about his dad, that I should, you know, I should, you know, give him, you know, donate some, some of the money. And I thought that would be the best way to do it. You yeah. know, just a percentage of the royalties yeah. and uh, starting with book one, no expenses deducted. I mean, you know, the first book, he got 25% of, of my royalty and, yeah. and so on. So, yeah, I, well, I, I feel great. great about that. That's great. Yeah. Well, it's a really good book and, and, and I'll stop talking. Yep. Here it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, all, all righty then, everybody. <laughs> uh, well, th thank you very much. I hope you all had a good time uh, watching on the show. Remember, the one more time, the book is Wicked Game. You can purchase it at bookpassage.com. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Michael has a, another way to purchase it from his website as well. I, in fact, I'm quite sure it is because that's how I figured out how to purchase it. Um, <laughs> uh, well, and, uh, it's, not, it's not from my web website. It's the publisher has a hmm. website, um, you know, um, and he sells direct from his website. But but they could get hopefully they can get the book from Book Passage. A absolutely. Um, yes, absolutely. You know, <laughs> and um, and and one thing it's it's called Wicked Game: The True Story of Guitarist James Calvin Wilsey. Hmm. Uh, well, you heard you heard that uh, you heard it there, everybody. Thank you very much. One more time for coming. Uh, it's been a real treat to listen to you two talk. Um, thank you again. Hope to see all of you in the next one. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much thank for having you. me. Yeah, really appreciate it.